good morning. How's everyone doing? Good, good. I'm excited uh, to be with you today and excited to continue. I, this is, uh, today's topic is kind of something that I'm, I'm pretty passionate about or something that uh, I feel is, is you know, kind of important to me. Um, and uh, and I, I want to talk about inner healing and I want to talk about, um, kind of, we're going to talk about healing, but not physical healing. We talked about that last week. If you missed it, you can get caught up online. But uh, I want to talk about emotional healing. And one of the reasons why I think maybe this, <laughs> this is so uh, I'm so passionate about this topic is because I, I came to the conclusion, you know, that I, that I was pretty emotionally broken. And uh, through years of, you know, inner healing and years of, of uh, dealing, you know, try, trying to navigate what that felt like, what that looked like, what that meant, and, uh, and what, what is God's plan for someone who's emotionally broken or emotionally needs emotional healing. And so, um, now a few weeks ago, we started this series called Destined for the Cross, and we asked this question on Easter, we started the series, and we asked this question, why did Jesus have to die? Like, what, what was the purpose of Jesus having to die? And of course, the, the main answer that all of us would, would give is probably something along the lines of forgiveness of sins. And on Easter Sunday, we talked about uh, uh, um, kind of the business of death and that sin always brings death. Sin always causes death. And so uh, we talked about Jesus had to die. Why? To pay the penalty for our sins. And then in week two, uh, Tony, he spoke and he talked about, um, to, uh, he talked about the justice. Why did Jesus have to, to die? Uh, to serve or fulfill the justice of God. And Tony specifically looked at seven statements that Jesus made on the cross, and it was a powerful message. Again, you can get caught up on all of these on our central hub. Now, week three, we talked about why did Jesus have to die? To make God's presence available to us again. All throughout the Old Testament, God's presence rested in temples, in, you know, in the temple that they would make, and uh, it did not rest with, with its original intent on human beings. It rested in temples. But then we know when Jesus died, the veil was torn, separating the most holy place from the, literally the rest of the world. So the presence of God could be felt by anyone who wants to experience it. And number four, last week we talked about, uh, uh, week four we talked about healing. Jesus died for our healing. And we looked at specifically Isaiah 53, that is this prophecy that, that the prophet Isaiah, obviously, uh, uh, has or, or makes or writes down, records uh, from what feels like a vision that he has about the cross. And he talks over and over and over again about healing being part of what happened at the cross. So my name's Nathan. I'm the lead pastor here at Ridgeline, and I'm so glad to be with you this morning as we continue this series we've been in called Destined for the Cross. When we were looking last week, when we were looking at Isaiah 53 last week, a, a few main things really stood out as far as what happened at Calvary, what happened with Jesus, what, what was paid for, what was accomplished, what was taken care of. And, and like we said, like we talked about last week, healing being one of them, healing being one of the, the main ones, physical healing, healing for our physical bodies, that was a big one. And of course, forgiveness of sins, and, and Isaiah says it several times that, um, that, there, that we need forgiveness of our sins and that Jesus, you know, different, different uh, kind of, he gives different perspectives of what happened to Jesus as a result of our sin and Jesus paying the penalty for our sin. But there's this verse in the middle that I kind of like. There's this verse in the middle that, keep in mind now, Isaiah is writing 700 years before Jesus. He's prophesying about the cross 700 years before Jesus, and he's prophesying about it as if he's kind of standing there watching it happen in real time. And he, here's the verse that, that we kind of just didn't stop at too much last time. In it, Isaiah 53, last week, Isaiah 53, starting in verse 4, yet he was the one who carried our sickness. He was the one who carried our sickness. Isaiah's making a note about Jesus and healing, which we looked at last week, and endured the torment of suffering. We viewed him as one who was being punished for something he himself had done. Of course, 
We know that's not true, right? I think it's John who wrote, he who knew no sin became sin so that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, right? Jesus lived a perfect life without sin. It was not a result of anything that he, would, uh, that he had done that he was crucified. As one who was struck down by God and brought low. Next verse says this. But it was because of our rebellious deeds that he was pierced. So our rebellious deeds, our sin, Jesus was pierced. And because of our sin that he was crushed. And then it says, he endured the punishment that made us completely whole. Now we did take a minute and look at this word whole, but let me remind you what it, what it means. It's, this is the Hebrew word shalom. Now, oftentimes, when we're translating from the Hebrew and we see the word shalom, we would put peace. But this is not the, the I love that this translator put whole because peace is only about 20% of what is trying to be communicated here or what is, what, uh, is meant to be communicated when you hear the word or see the word shalom. The Hebrew word means peace, of course, means prosperity. We don't like that one in church for some reason. It means, it means wholeness. It means success, and it means well-being. That's what shalom means. Shalom. Now, I've been in Israel, and I've seen people greet each other uh, uh, um, uh, in Israel and, and practicing Jews here, you know, in other places of the word, world, that they will greet you with this term, shalom. I can't think of a nicer, per, nicer thing to say to somebody. Hey, man, I hope that you have peace, prosperity, wholeness, success, and well-being. <laughs> have a good day. <laughs> like, that's really nice. This is a very big and powerful and, and, and kind of uh, like a, a downplayed word when we just say peace. It doesn't mean the same thing. It means so much more. And so I love that. He says he, says, uh, he endured the punishment that made us completely whole. God's punishment, now, I know some of you won't like this, purchased your ability to prosper. God's punishment purchased your ability to be successful. God's punishment purchased your ability to experience wholeness and well-being. And in his woundings, we find our healing. Now, I want to talk about the three parts of what make us us, what makes you you. In fact, one of those is pretty dominant. It's not what you think. But first, I want, to, I want to show this to you biblically real fast. The Apostle Paul said it like this in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and here's what he says. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through, and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Spirit soul being just like we serve a triune god there's a father son and holy spirit there's three parts to the trinity we ourselves are triune beings we have a spirit we have a soul and we have a body and here, let me define them a little bit for you here and here's the first one is a spirit or we have a spirit that must be redeemed right that's the eternal part of us that when sin entered the world our relationship with god was broken right Number two, we have a soul that must be restored. That's kind of like our inner parts. That's what's on the inside of it. That's, we'll get into that in a minute. And then number three, we have a body. And of course, the body it has to surrender, which we won't get into too much. So let me tell you, let's, let's go in reverse order. Let, let me tell you about your body or our body. The first one is our body. In Genesis chapter 22, verses 7, we learn that God formed our bodies from the earth. God formed our bodies, right? It was up from the, from the dust of the ground. Adam was created. And the body acts as a temporary housing or a shell that contains our soul and our spirit. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, the Apostle Paul says that, that our bodies are a temple of the Holy Spirit. Now, I love this because uh, remember what we, we talked about a couple of weeks ago and we briefly brushed on just now is that when Jesus died on the cross, the veil was torn. Now, 
there's this picture that we don't get when just from reading Scripture, we have to also understand proper historical context, which is vital when you're reading Scripture, okay? If not, you'll misinterpret it, and you'll get it wrong, and you'll, then people start movements and kill each other, and bad things happen, okay? It's, it's, it's important that we get Scripture right. But there's this historical context that there would be this, this picture of the, the, the God's rest on temples. God's rest on temples. All of the religions around Israel who served all of their gods, who served you know, whatever it was that they were serving, they, they would have this mindset, this understanding. It was just built into the culture of who they were, who they were, and what they believed, that, that God's rest on temples. Now, of course, sin enters to the world in Genesis chapter 3, and no longer is God able to rest on his people, but God still wants to be close to his people, and so he eventually, as, as Israel is developed and all of that, he has them build a what? A temple, and he rests on it or in it. And I love this. We, we try to model our church after this kind of picture uh, of Israel camping through the desert as the, the glory cloud or the presence of God above the temple uh, would move. Israel would break camp and they would move. And then when the, when the glory cloud would stop moving, then they would set up camp and everyone would camp around the presence of the Lord. And that's who I want us to be as a church, is that we would camp around the goodness and the glory and the presence of the Lord. When he's on the move, we're on the move. And when he's not on the move, we're not trying to get ahead of him. And so there's this whole perspective in the Old Testament about, about that it's, it's the will of the gods to rest in temples. And then Paul writes, 1 Corinthians 6, that our bodies are the temple. That now we get to be what houses the presence of the Lord all over again, just like in the Garden of Eden. And so it's the outward part, and it's not the most important part, our bodies. In fact, if you, it's probably the least important part. All right, number two, soul. Our soul. This is the one I want to kind of talk about for, for today. See, the soul, I, I love this, the soul is uh, one of God's, I would say, one of God's most beautiful creations. Your soul is one of God's most beautiful creations. It enables us to experience relationships and appreciate the beauty of our surrounding. We have been made in the image of God, each one of us has been made in the image of God with the capacity to think, reason, and express emotion. And all of that is a result of your soul. See, God could have programmed us to do uh, and, and to be whatever he wanted us, but instead, he gave us the ability to choose. He gave us the ability to choose. Now, in, in some circles, theologically, there's a big debate here about whether or not you have free will or all of your actions have been predestined. I, I, I believe that you have free will. If anybody who's raised kids believes in free will, <laughs> like, what is wrong with them? <laughs> they were, that was not predestined by God. <laughs> but I love this. Your soul is what makes you you. Your soul is what makes you you. I recognize your body, your physical appearance, but when I sit down and have coffee with you and get to know you, I'm getting to know your soul. The three parts that make up our soul. Here's the first one. The mind. Our mind. Which thinks and reasons. We have our mind. Oftentimes we point to our head when, we, when we're talking about our mind. but Because I, I don't know why we do that. It, our, this is our brain. It's not our mind. It's different. Uh, a, my, your mind is part of your soul, not part of your physical body. Um, anyway. Sometimes, you know, when people say, I just have a, I just, I feel it in my brain. No, people say, I feel it in my gut, right? It's a different part, right? It's, it's a sense. It's something you know in your soul, not your head. All right, different. All right, number two, the will. Which makes choices? Mine stubbornly sometimes. 
It's the will, right? It's the will. It's what, this is the part of me that makes decisions, that gets to choose, that wants my own way, for better, for worse. And number three, the emotions. The emotions which believe, feel, and remember. Your emotions are a large part of your memory capacity. In fact, if you, if you have any type of sexual trauma, uh, then, then a great book for you to, I would recommend is called The Body Keeps the Score, or any type of physical abuse or any type like severe physical trauma or abuse, The Body Keeps the Score is a great understanding of why there's certain times of year or certain um, places or people or whatever that will trigger all of that, and it will help you uh, understand and, and, and heal, be, get some healing. All right, the third part of us, is the spirit, right? The spirit. We are a spirit. This is important for us to understand. We are a spirit with a temporary body. We are a spirit with a temporary body. God's plan is that our spirit uh, is that our spirit communes with his spirit, right? And that fellowship is what was broken uh, in Genesis 3 with sin, all right? And uh, we are able to do so because of Christ's finished work on the cross, right? We, we sin, Jesus paid the penalty for our sins. Now, if we want, our spirits can be in um, communication or be in fellowship with God the Father, right? That's what we're doing when we choose to make Jesus Christ our Lord and Savior, or we are at salvation, some of us may call it, right? We, we are rejoining our spirit back to the spirit of our Father, All right? Awesome. Now, I want to look at some wounds, and I want to talk about some wounds, and I want to give you kind of a, uh, an overview of what to do with, with soul wounds, okay? And depending on the wound, you may have to approach it a little bit differently. I, 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 we're not gonna, we've done many of these types of series where we go in and look at, we look at one thing at a time, anxiety, we look at depression, we look at anger, we look at, you know, whatever. And we deal with those very specifically. But I'm going to give you some, this will be a little broader than that. But I, for a lot of us, we go, yeah, I don't have any soul wounds. So I want to talk about some symptoms of soul wounds. This is not an exhaustive list, all right? This is just some uh, that I have dealt with personally. Not really. Maybe. Yeah, probably most of these. All right. Depression. 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 It, unless it is a chemical thing, which it can be, and this is the only one that can also have, could be a chemical thing, I think. Um, uh, I've, and I've dealt with depression both on a chemical level and on a soul wound kind of level, and uh, n- neither of them are fun to, do, <laughs> fun to, to work through and deal with. Okay, depression. If you if you feel down more than you don't, then you may have some deep soul wounds that you just take time and let's address them, right? Anxiety. Anxiety, 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 anxiety. Fear. If you're afraid, if you're afraid, you constantly live in fear. You you put everything through the filter of, yeah, but what if happens? Right? That's fear. Um, anger. Anger is a symptom of a soul wound. Anger, it's not, well, that's just how my dad was and how my granddad was and how my great-granddad was. No. Anger is a symptom of a soul wound. Okay, nobody likes this one. All right, bitterness. <laughs> uh, bitterness is a, is a soul wound or a symptom of a soul wound. Unforgiveness is a symptom of a soul wound. Short-temperedness. Always on edge, always ready to snap, always ready to break, right on the brink, living there. Once in a while, we all have bad days, okay? But like every day doesn't, like every day is not okay. Every day is, that's not, that's not okay. <laughs> you got something else going on. Lack of self-control. Lack of self-control. This could be uh, with, you know, you just don't take care of yourself. It could be with eating. It could be a bad habit. It could be, you know, whatever it is. A lack of self-control. Um, mean-spirited. You don't ever get angry. You're just mean. You know? You're just mean-spirited. You're just always quietly out to get somebody. Or revenge or whatever it is. Mean spirited, overly sensitive. Overly sensitive. All the husbands who got nudged back at anger 
Um, all right. <laughs> Overly sensitive. All right. This is, I want this one to sink in for some people. This is a result of a soul wound. Okay? Um, I don't know if... Uh, overly sensitive. Okay. <laughs> Can't feel love. Can't feel love or don't feel love. Never really feel loved. You, you know, like, in your mind, you know, I know my parents love me or I know my spouse loves me or I'm, I know, you know, my friends love me. I know whatever. But you don't, there's, it, you don't feel it. There's no... Don't feel loved. Uh, self-hate. Self-hate. Not, you like really don't like who you are. If who you were, if who you are was a different person, you wouldn't hang out with them. <laughs> self-hate. Lastly, lastly, cutting or self-harm. Cutting or self-harm. Any type of self-harm. Or, you know, and specifically cutting is, um, you know, one of the most obvious forms of self-harm. This is a result of a soul wound, excuse me. Next. There they go. So there's this guy in the Bible, his name, there's this author of the Bible. And he's in the Bible a little bit. But he's best known for his writing. And I think the only reason he's in the Bible is first because of his own writing. His name's Luke. And he's this great researcher. And he records this great moment in the life of Christ. He records this incredible moment in the life of Christ. And now, now here's what's happening. Jesus is just getting off the heels of being tempted. Okay, and there's there's a lot going on here. He's he's pretty well known in Nazareth already because uh, I'm trying to decide how deep to get into this. He he's known in Nazareth. So uh, and this is chapter four of Luke, and here's what happens. Um, Jesus goes into the synagogue, and he reads from Isaiah sixty one. He reads, now this is just a few chapters uh, past what we looked at, you know, last week and just a few minutes ago, Isaiah 53, right? So Jesus reads out of Isaiah 61, and Jesus spoke this kind of bold declaration or decree over his own life and, identif um, and uh, identity over what, this is who I am, this is what my ministry is going to look like, this is what I'm here for, before he works any miracles, this, this is when this takes place. And so let's, let's look at this, Luke chapter 4, here's what it says. This is Jesus reading from Isaiah 61, quoting the prophet Isaiah, who was prophesying about Jesus, okay? The Spirit of the Lord is upon me and has anointed me to be hope. Now, some translations here say good news, which I think is, is a fair uh, uh, translation or whatever. And what I love about this is hope or good news is what is the gospel? We, the word gospel literally means good news, right? This is what Jesus came to be is good news. What else is the gospel? The gospel is hopeful. It brings hope to dead people. It brings hope to all of us who are dead in our trespasses and our sins. It's good news and it's hope. And he has anointed me to be the hope for the poor. Now, if you were to apply the definition for poor that most of us apply, then this would mean that the gospel doesn't apply to any of us. Doesn't apply. It's good news for the poor. But here's the good news. In Scripture, when you see the word poor, oftentimes it has four complete, to be a complete understanding of the word, there's four definitions, not just one. 
There's four definitions, and I, I love this because it just brings so much more hope to uh, all the, like, blessed are the poor. Yeah, so Jesus wasn't just talking about in Matthew chapter-ish. Uh, he, he wasn't just talking to poor people, although that's true. There was a cultural issue at the time where poor people thought that God didn't love them or care about them, right? There, there was this kind of thing. But, but poor in Scripture has four definitions that, that are all equal. It's, it's, it's poor in finances, Poor in motivation or opportunity. Um, poor in, oh man. Poor, there's a third one. And then the fourth one is spiritually, oh, relationally poor. That's what it is. So financially poor, opportunity or motivationally poor. There, then there's um, relationally poor. And then there's spiritually poor. So blessed are the poor. Or the gospel is for the poor. Those who are, you, you may be fine financially, you may even have a lot of friends, but you're spiritually poor because you don't have a relationship with God the Father. Well, there's good news. There's good news. Jesus has come. And Jesus says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to be hope for the relationally poor, the spiritually poor, financially poor, those who are poor in opportunity. All right. We got that covered. Healing for the brokenhearted. Healing for the brokenhearted. Now, this is good. Isaiah 51. 53, talks about Jesus heals our physical body. Jesus on the cross takes care of our sins. Jesus makes us whole, which could have to do with your soul, but it still feels a little vague. Jesus says, healing for the brokenhearted. Healing for the brokenhearted. Healing for people with soul wounds. Not just physical healing in your body, not just spiritual healing with restoration between you and the Father, but people, healing for people with soul wounds. And new eyes for the blind. Now this is kind of cool, it doesn't mean anything, but this word eyes here in, um, in Mark chapter 6, it's translated gazed into heaven. I just think that's cool, gazed into heaven. All right. Eyes for the blind, and to preach to the prisoners. Now, this literally means prisoners of war. Prisoners of war. And you are set free. This is what you're preaching to the. This is what Jesus is here to preach to prisoners. You are set free. I have come to share this message of jubilee for the time of God's great acceptance has begun. Okay, jubilee is this. It was the fiftieth year. Uh, in, so, you have to back up so far, right? Uh, so, when it comes to time, the, the Jewish culture, they view time as cyclical. Like, we view it linear, right? Like this. Well, they didn't view it that way. Time always comes back around. That's why uh, we see throughout Scripture uh, many times, is, and then God remembered Abraham and fulfilled, what, da, 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 da. right? Why? Did God forget about Abraham? <laughs> like, no. What? Time came back around. And it was the right timing now. It was the right timing to fulfill the promise. It was the right. And I feel like for when I was preparing this, I feel like that that was a message for some of us this morning is that we feel like God forgot about us. We feel like uh, God is, you know, we have these dreams and everything's falling apart and, uh, you know, relationships or, or whatever. And, and I felt like the Lord said that I, I, I haven't forgotten. I'm remembering them again. It's cyclical. It's coming back around. Get ready. And so this was... The 50th year, so after 49 years, seven times seven, right? This was the 50th year when all the debts were canceled, and you know, if you were, if you were paying off a debt by physically working as a servant or a slave, that was can't, like this, this is the year of Jubilee, was restoration year. Restoration. For the time of God's great acceptance has begun. Acceptance or favor. 
I love the way you could say this phrase, like, like the year when God will accept man. I love that. The year when God will accept man. And so I believe that God wants to heal, not just our relationships or our, our bodies, but he also wants to heal soul wounds. He wants to heal our soul. So how do you treat a soul wound? I got four things and then, then we're done. Number one. Do you need a hand? You good? All right. <laughs> Number one, uh, treat the wound, okay? In other words, treat the wound, not the symptom, okay? Anger management classes are great, but the anger will always be there if you don't get down to the actual wound. You don't get down to that fact that you grew up in an abusive household and your dad always yelled and you've never really gotten over it and now you yell. So you can learn tips and tricks. You can count to 10 all you want. <laughs> okay? You can hold your thumbs or you can do whatever it is. But don't deal with the wound. Deal with the wound. The symptoms go away when you deal when the wound goes away, the symptoms go away. So deal with the wound, not the symptom. And sometimes it, it just is, we need to repent for the, the root. Whatever's, whatever is the main, whatever that thing, God, forgive me. I, I do need to get over my dad's anger, but also forgive me for being bitter. Forgive me. Forgive me for holding a grudge for 35 years. Forgive me. Forgive me. And so sometimes we need to deal with the wound and we need to repent or ask God to forgive, forgive us and, and not just ask for healing for the symptoms. Deal with the root number two. Get out the, get out the infection or the toxin. And some of us have issues that if we would just change our friends, it would, they would be pretty easy to deal with. We're in toxic relationships or toxic environments. Like some of we gossip, and everybody gossips at my work. And that's, you know, like every, just everybody gossips, and yeah, sometimes I gossip. No, don't do that. Change jobs. Do, do like, get new friends. Do, do something. Make it, make it change. Make it change here, and then go into work and say, you know what? Hey, guys, I've decided we're not going to do this anymore. And it's fine if you want to continue, but you continue it in your office, not in mine. And be loving and all that. Get out the infection and the toxins. If you, you might have a wound or you may be angry all the time because you're addicted. You're dealing with an addiction that you just can't beat. And it's so infuriating that you walk around angry all the time. Well, deal with the addiction. Deal with the wound. Get out the infection. Get out the toxins. Get out. All right, number three. Cover it over to heal. Now, this is a good one. Cover it over to heal. What do I mean by that? Like, you know, you would put a bandage on a big cut or whatever. Cover it over to heal with healthy friendships or relationships and good spiritual disciplines. Cover it over to heal with healthy friendships and relationships and spiritual disciplines and, and maybe a good, a good, and if you can, godly counselor or uh, some pastoral counseling or some people who will get on your team and gently once in a while help you lift off the bandage and just say, hey, is everything okay under there? I'm not here to poke at it or prod it or make it harder or ruin your life or tell everybody your business. I'm just here to help you remove the bandage and clean the wound from time to time. Look under and ask, is everything okay over here? And when, when things are getting better or looking better, then you celebrate. 
celebrate. People, bring, bring the right people alongside you, the right relationships, the right spiritual disciplines, the, all of the good things. Why? So you can cover over what was exposed previously and it can have time to heal properly. And I, I love this. Peter Scazzaro has this great book called Emotionally Healthy Spirituality. And I highly recommend it. And I didn't get this quote from the book, but it's, it's, I made it up. But it's probably from the book, okay? Like, I didn't like go look in the book and quote something, but this sounds like something he would say. Emotional maturity is a part of spiritual maturity. You cannot be spiritually mature while, re- while remaining emotionally immature. Your, your three parts of your, your body, soul, spirit, imagine like the, um, the slats on a, on a wine barrel, right? If, if one is shorter than the rest of them, it doesn't matter how tall they are, <laughs> the rest of them, the water's going to leak out, the wine's going to leak out at the shortest one. And some of us want to go, yeah, but look how spiritual I am. Yeah, but look how immature you are. You're leaking out all over the place. You leak out all over everyone. Can't hold anything. Yeah, but I read my Bible. That's so good. But you need to deal with this too. You can't be spiritually mature while remaining emotionally immature. What we believe... Why? Let me, let me say it like this. Because uh, this question kind of hit me this week. Okay, how do I... How do I? Because I, I believe in, in healing. I believe in instant healing from the Father. I believe that God wants to heal. He loves to heal. It's Jesus paid for healing at the cross. I believe all of that. But sometimes here's... This, is, this one was tough for me to work through this week as I was studying. And, uh, uh, why we believe... Why do we believe that you can have instant healing in your physical body, but often there needs to be a process for emotional or soul wounds or soul healing? Why did, why did, and I'm going like, yeah, I definitely would believe that uh, emotional healing is often a process, and yet when we, when we see people healed in our church, it's like, man, they're, they're, it's just instant most of the time like what's the difference and here's here's what i feel like the the holy spirit kind of gave me some insight on all of this is that god wants us to deal with the source not the symptoms god wants us to deal with the source. here watch number four if we will deal with the wound he will bring the healing if you can't deal with the wound ask god for help in dealing with the wound Ask God for help, but it, it, it's, it's, it's about free will. It's about free will. That's what it's about. He won't make you forgive someone so he can heal you emotionally. He won't make you, you know, apologize. He won't make you. And for as long as that's there, he can't. He can't heal you. He won't make you deal with it, like force you, like, you know. And he certainly won't heal you up over top of whatever is going on. It'd be like if you went, you got something in your arm and they just stitched it up over top of it. God won't do that to you. He's not going to do that. He's not going to heal a wound that has something in it. But I believe if you're here this morning, you say, you know what? I have some emotional hurt. I have some soul wounds. I got some stuff down on the inside of me. I've got a lot of symptoms. I've got a lot of whatever, but I want to, I want to get down to the bottom of it and I want to deal with the root of it. And I believe as soon as you do, 
then the Holy Spirit of God, who is so loving and so tender and so faithful, will just come and embrace you and begin to bring healing to your soul. So to ask the question we asked at the beginning, why did Jesus have to die? It's not just for our physical healing, but it's for our emotional healing and wholeness as well. Let's stand.